Good morning, afternoon, and evening. I'm Rosa Herrera from Mexico TV Social Observatory, and I'm joining my co-chair, Lindsay McKenna from Treatment Action Group. On behalf of myself and Lindsay and our distinguished panel, I'd like to welcome you and to thank you for joining us for this Communities Connection session, Researcher Sharing with Communities, Part 1, Shorter Regimens for Drug Sensitive TV. If you enjoyed this session, please make sure to tune in for our two shorter regimens for drug resistant TV starting at 10 a.m. Easter time. Three phase three trials evaluating whether, whether treatment regimens for drug sensitive TV could be shortened to, sh to two, two or four months, were completed recently Rifa Short, Truncate TV, and Simplicity TV. During these sessions, researchers from these three studies will share their findings in or in the case of Simplicity TV, prepare us for findings to still be presented and then respond to questions. We will start with presentations from Amina Janani from St. George University of London, Leandra Lombard from the TV Alliance, and Nicholas Patton from the University of Singapore. Then, here to our community responders, Global TV Cap members, Patrick Abghazi and Diptendu Bachaira, before opening up the question and answer to the wider audience. We hope you enjoy the presentations and look forward to seeing you after for the live Q&A discussion. There is general agreement that the treatment duration for tuberculosis needs to be significantly reduced in order to get better compliance, higher cure rates, and reduced transmission. There is also evidence to show that higher dose rifampicin clears the persistent bacilli more rapidly, therefore allowing the treatment duration to be reduced. Here at St. George's, we conducted the Riffershort trial, which was an international multicenter controlled clinical trial to evaluate 1200 milligrams and 1800 milligrams to pampersin daily in the reduction of treatment duration of pulmonary tuberculosis from six to four months. The trial design consisted of three arms. The first was the standard uh, six month duration with which you're all familiar. The second was the 1200 milligrams of rifampicin, which was double the standard dose daily for four months. And the third was also a four month arm with 1800 milligrams of rifampicin, that is triple the standard dose again for four months. We screened 757 patients and excluded 85 who did not meet the criteria for randomization. So we were left with 672 patients who underwent randomization and 224 were assigned to the control arm, 223 to the 1200 milligram rifampicin arm known as study regimen one, and 225 for the 1800 regimen, uh, which was known as study regimen two. The inclusion exclusion criteria were pretty standard for this kind of a phase three trial. In addition to microscopy positive patients, we also admitted patients who were gene expert positive, rifampicin susceptible, if they had had no treatment before. If they were 18 years and over in order to be able to give informed consent, and if they lived within reasonable distance of the clinic so that they could be monitored more easily. The exclusion criteria were patients who had conditions that might have interfered with their continuation with the allocated regimen. 
We also excluded patients with diabetes and seropositivity because we were concerned that the treatment for these conditions might have interfered with the treatment dose of rifampicin. The schedule of investigations are pretty rigorous. Um, you can see that while they were on treatment, full blood count and liver function tests were done regularly. In addition, they had regular extreme examination by gene expert and also by microscopy. Every treatment dose had to be directly observed. Patients in South America attended the clinic daily because they lived fairly near the clinic and the transport was good. Those in Africa, we had to modify the observation because they lived far away and the transport was pretty poor. So we assigned their treatment supervision to a person known as the domiciliary treatment monitor where a family member or some responsible person living near them to the patient would give the patient their daily dose and make sure that they had swallowed it. This DTM kind of treatment is frowned on by certain groups because I'm told it increases the divorce rate in North America. But here amongst the Africans, we had no such uh, outcomes. On the other hand, involve the patient in the cure of the patient, of the uh, sick people, and also remove the stigma for tuberculosis. The primary outcome measures were two important ones. Since the objective of the trial was to reduce treatment duration by increasing the dose of rivampicin, the primary outcome measure is the combined rate of failure at the end of treatment and relapse during the subsequent 12 months. In addition, again, because the dose of rifampicin was increased, unwanted side effects were, uh, such as grade three and four adverse events were closely monitored. Enrollment began in January, 2017 and continued pretty regularly. You will notice that there is a gap, a three month gap here. That was when the coronavirus epidemic overtook the, uh, these patients in all the centers and they were told to stop enrollment to the tuberculosis trial. That embargo was lifted after about three months and we were able to continue with enrollment and to achieve our sample size. Thus, at the end of enrollment, we had a total of 672 patients, 54 from Botswana, 175 from Guinea, 224 in Uganda, 119 in Peru, 70 in Nepal, and 30 in Pakistan. The baseline characteristics in these three groups, when considering age and weight, and smoking situation and um, chest x-rays were pretty much the similar in all three groups. There was no one group that stood out as having a, a, an odd result. They were pretty much the same in all the three groups. When it came to the analysis, the, this was the MITT uh, primary outcome is we analyzed all the patients who had been randomized, uh, whether they subsequently dropped out or not. And this was known as the intention to treat primary outcome. And as you can see from those who had a favorable results, there were 93% in the control arm, 90% in study regimen one, and almost 87% in study regimen two. This was a surprising result because we thought, indeed we based the trial on the fact that if the dose of rifampicin was increased, 
so the cure rates would be increased as well. But it turned out in this trial it was not so. Amongst the unfavorable results, again, you will see 7% uh, in the control regimen, 10 in study regimen 1, and 13 in study regimen 2. One other result I would point out to you that at the end of treatment, we examined two consecutive sputum specimens to see if they had culture converted. And you can see that in the control arm patients, there were only two such patients who had not achieved culture negativity by the end of treatment, nine in study regimen one and nine in study regimen two. Again, a disappointing result. This is the pro protocol analysis. That is to say, this was a group in which all the treatment was followed exactly according to the protocol. And again, amongst this group, the control regimen had a 95, nearly 96% uh, favorable outcome, whereas study regimen one had only 91, and study regimen two did worse with only 89 with a favorable result. Again, a, a surprising and a disappointing result. However, in the unfavorable results followed the pattern we would have expected, that is only eight in the control arm, but 13 in the study regimen one and 20 in study regimen two. Now, this was the other primary outcome, the safety outcomes, where we looked at the serious adverse events, and you can see that in all the three uh, arms, the serious adverse events were three, three, and three in total, which was encouraging. And when it came to the hepatotoxicity, the uh, adverse events were five in the control group. But they went up in study regimen one and up again to 13 in study regimen two, which was an expected result. So both in the efficacy outcomes and the safety outcomes, this trial did not meet our uh, criteria to reduce treatment duration. We're grateful to a group of people for funding this trial, the Joint Global Health Trial Scheme, the Medical Research Council, the Wellcome Trust, the Department for International Development, the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership, and the Aachen Foundation in Canada. The trial management team based at St. George's were myself and Tom Harrison. The micros microbiologists were Professor Philip Butcher and Dr. Jazz Dillon. The da data managers, trial managers were Tulika and Jack Adams. Our statisticians were based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, that's Catherine Fielding and Daniel Grint. Their data management was carried out at IDI Kampala, and this trial was sponsored by the uh, St. George's Joint Research and Enterprise Service uh, under Suvir Begi. The participating centers were St. George's, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Uganda, Nepal, Botswana, Peru, Guinea, Pakistan, and monitoring was also provided by the Infectious Diseases Unit of New Mexico in Albuquerque. The principal investigators at these centers were Dr. Eduardo Ticona, Dr. Tefera Aijizu, Dr. Daniel Atwine, Professor Kamara, Professor Basu, Dr. Bubakar, Dr. Bhavna Shrestha, Dr. Saeed Hamid, Professor Bushra, and Dr. Faisal Sultan. These are the principal investigators of the trial centers who conducted the trial so very well. And at the centers, these were all the people who 
helped to patient enroll, to allocate the treatment, to see that they took their treatment, and to be followed up, right, as they were supposed to be followed up. Good afternoon. My name is Leandra Lombard and I work with the TB Alliance. I'm a director in the clinical operations team and the Simplicit TB trial manager. Um, this afternoon, I'm gonna share with you a clinical trial update. So the TB Alliance is a not-for-profit organization and we are dedicated to the discovery and the development and delivery of better and faster acting and affordable TB drugs that are available to those in need. We have developed a new treatment for highly drug resistant TB, XDR. We have launched improved treatments for children with TB and transformed how TB treatments are developed. Um, we have revived the pipeline for new TB drugs and mobilized a global network of partners. Our triple A mandate is to develop pro products and make them accessible to every person who needs them. So our global network of partners is represented in this slide as trial sites, community engagement sites, donors, um, our portfolio, and very importantly, our stakeholders association. Our drug development pipeline as of August 2022 is represented here. And if you have a look towards the uh, right side of the slide under the phase three trials, you will note that Simplicit TB is indicated in the de late development pipeline. So what is Simplicit TB? Um, and we numbered the trial NC008. So Simplicit TB is an open label, partially randomized trial to evaluate the efficacy, the safety and tolerability of a four month treatment of bedaquilin, protominid, moxifloxacin and pyrazinamide compared to a six month treatment of HRZ and HR, which is the standard of care and control in this trial in adult participants with drug sensitive and smear positive PTB. And a six month treatment of BPAMZ in adult participants with drug resistant and smear positive pulmonary TB. So the acronym that we use BPAMZ represents bedaquilin as B, PA as protominid, M as moxifloxacin and Z as pyrazinamide. The well-known HRZD is depicted as isoniazid H, R for rifampicin, Z for pyrazinamide, and E for ethambutol. This slide is actually a picture of one of the Simplicity B trials, a uh, site that have participated in our trial. Um, that evaluated a new regimen for DS and DRTB. So the enrollment or randomization as we call it commenced on the 30th of July 2018 actually at a site in Georgia and it completed on the 2nd of March 2020 at one of our sites in Russia. Participants were enrolled at 26 sites in eight countries across of our continents. So the trial timeline um, stretched across from screening to 24 months after the start of treatment. So in total, participants were required to be involved in the trial for two years from randomization to end of follow-up. Two of the three arms were randomized this is the partially blinded arm to either BPAMZ, or which was for four months, and or HRZD for six months. 
We did two evaluations at both eight weeks and 52 weeks and um, a final evaluation at month 24 or two years after the start of treatment. And then the third arm were a group of patients, 150 of our participants who were assigned to BPAMZ for six months as they would have been diagnosed with DRTB. So the sites were represented and who participated were uh, based in Russia. And in total, Russia contributed 24 participants. Our single site in Georgia contributed 52 participants. In Brazil, 35 participants. Um, a total of 196 participants in South Africa, Tanzania, 107, Uganda, 17, Malaysia, 7, and the Philippines, 17. So our results are forthcoming, and our top line results have been submitted for a presentation um, at a scientific conference in the near future. The study team is currently developing a manuscript for publication in a peer-reviewed journal, and we are also planning individual, virtual, and in-person results reviews with key stakeholders. Um, we are also planning an in-person workshop for our community engagement partners who were not only critical but pivotal um, in the conduct of Simplicity TV to understand the results and to develop dissemination strategies. Very importantly, none of this work could have been possible without our donors and we thank them sincerely. So the questions will be, will be handled now in the live Q&A, and I thank you for your, your time today. Hello, I'm Nick Payton from the Nash University of Singapore, and I appreciate the opportunity to present and discuss the Truncate TB trial in this community session. Here are my disclosures. Now, if we look back at early trials with standard TB drugs, it's clear that although the relapse rate is higher when you reduce treatment duration below six months, most people are actually cured with regimens as short as two or three months. So this means that with standard six months of treatment or even four months of treatment, the majority are being overtreated in order to prevent relapse in a minority. So we hypothesize that overall outcomes may be as good or better in a program setting if we treat everyone with a much shorter initial course of treatment, just long enough to cure the majority, and then shift the resources to early detection and retreatment of relapses in the minority of people who are not cured with shorter treatment. And this approach has potential advantages for people with tuberculosis and for programs. To test this hypothesis, we defined a truncate management strategy comprising treatment for an initial period of eight weeks, extended to week 10 or week 12 in people with persistent clinical disease, meaning um, both TB symptoms and having a positive smear at week eight, and then monitoring after the end of treatment with monthly TB symptom assessments and one to three monthly sputum smears to detect people um, with possible relapse. And then for the minority who relapse, retreating with a six month standard treatment regimen. And whether the person requires eight weeks of initial treatment only or a further period of retreatment later, if they're eventually cured, then the main goal of treatment has been achieved. And in the truncate TB trial, we compared this truncate strategy against the standard treatment for 24 weeks. And success was evaluated by comparing the proportion between arms who had unsatisfactory clinical outcome at week 96, defined as death before week 96, or having active TB at week 96, or being on TB treatment at week 96. So for the initial eight week regimens, we selected four that we thought might have the best chance of getting a reasonable relapse rate. Each was based on the standard four drug combination, but with at least two changes to increase sterilizing efficacy. So uh, we had a high dose rifampicillin linazolid arm, a high dose rifampicillin clofazamine arm, a rifapentin linazolid arm, and a bedaquilin linazolid arm. The main eligibility criteria for the trial were having a sputum gene expert with no evidence of rifampicin resistance, um, initially, we excluded those with sputum 
smear three plus or with a big cavity on chest x-ray or who were HIV positive, but these exclusion criteria were removed later in the trial. The trial was coordinated from Singapore and conducted at 18 sites. And we enrolled 675 participants over a period of two years to March 2020, uh, the majority from Indonesia and Philippines with additional substantial contributions from Uganda and Thailand and India. And just as important, the loss to follow-up rate was tiny, less than 1%. So almost everyone uh, came back for evaluation at week 96. We stopped randomizing to two of the strategy arms early, the high-dose rifampicin and clefazimine arm and the rifapentin and linazolid arm, uh, for pragmatic reasons, just to ensure that we had enough recruitment in the other two truncate strategy arms to, to conduct the final analysis. So the study population were majority male under 35 years of age, had a moderate um, burden disease, majority having cavitation on chest x-ray, um, two thirds had medium or high burden disease uh, indicated on the gene expert test. Although we opened up enrollment to participants with HIV infection in the later stages of the trial, none were actually enrolled, possibly reflecting the low HIV co-infection rates in the population attending these Asian sites. So here are the results of the primary efficacy outcome. In the standard treatment arm, the proportion with unsatisfactory outcome at week 96 was 3.9% in the purple box you can see there. In the um, top in the green boxes with the truncate strategy arm with initial high dose for and linazolid, the proportion at week 96 with unsatisfactory outcome was 11.4%. So the difference um, adjusted was 7.2%. And the important thing is if you look at the figure at the top right, 13%, uh, this is the upper limit of the confidence interval. It's higher than our pre-specified margin of 12% meaning that the truncate strategy with high dose rifampicin and linazolid did not meet the criterion for non-inferiority. But in contrast, when you look at the, the below panel, um, uh, which is the bedaquil and linazolid initial treatment, the strategy with that, um, the difference between standard treatment and uh, the, the, the strategy was 0.8%, so essentially no difference. And the upper limit of the confidence interval you can see on the right there is 5%, which is well within the 12% uh, um, pre-specified margin, indicating that the truncate strategy with initial bedaquil and linazolid is non-inferior, meaning as good as standard treatment. And this was the primary goal of the trial. Having shown that, we can then look at potential advantages and disadvantages on the secondary outcomes. Um, so firstly, participant-centered secondary outcomes. And the key one here is the total uh, time on treatment over 96 weeks, 180 days in the standard treatment arm um, was reduced to 106 days in the truncate strategy with high rifilinazolid and 85 days, so effectively half um, the number of days on treatment in the truncate strategy, bedaquil and linazolid, um, which was statistically significant in both of these um, arms. Uh, there's no difference in quality of life or days of work or nutrition recovery in the two groups. Looking at the safety outcomes, essentially no difference um, between, the, between the strategy and the standard treatment, no evidence of harm on grade three or four adverse events, serious adverse events, respiratory disability, uh, et cetera. And then for the program-centered secondary outcomes, well, treatment adherence was high and the default rate was low in both the truncate strategy arms and the standard treatment, no difference. Um, the estimated transmission risk over the study period was higher in the strategy arms, as you'd expect given the great, greater burden of relapses, but the difference was modest, an extra two to three days of infectiousness per participant over 96 weeks, and very few new household contacts exposed. And there was no new confirmed drug resistance in the standard treatment arm or in the truncate strategy arm with initial high-dose rifampicin linazolid, but there were two cases of acquired resistance in the bedaquilin uh, linazolid um, strategy arm, so around 1.1%, but both of these were successfully retreated with standard treatment. We also assessed acceptability using a questionnaire to participants. Um, two key findings shown here. Uh, firstly, being allocated to the strategy with initial two months of treatment increased people's motivation to take treatment. There seemed to be an um, advantage of that over the standard treatment, perhaps not surprising. Uh, and the majority of people who um, uh, were in the strategy group, um, so around 70-75% say they would recommend the strategy to a friend um, who needed treatment uh, for TB. And we also asked clinicians 
with the experience of the managing with the strategy and the trial, and they said uh, about 85% or higher said they would recommend um, the strategy to a future patient or to a family member with TB or to colleagues treating TB. So in summary, the truncate strategy was as good as the standard treatment on clinical outcome at week 96 with the initial bedaquiline and linazolid regimen, but not with high dose rifampicin linazolid regimen. The strategy appeared safe with no excess of severe or serious adverse events, death or respiratory disability. Uh, it produced a substantial reduction in overall time on treatment and increased motivation to take initial treatment. Um, there was a low risk of drug resistance and resistance was only seen with the bedaquiline regimen. And the strategy was broadly acceptable to participants and clinicians who had experienced managing patients with the strategy. So what are the implications of the, these findings? Well, the trial um, has shown that alternatives to over-treating the large majority of people with TB can be successful. That's an important step and an important new research direction, which has the promise to improve outcomes for patients and programs in the future. We can certainly work to refine and improve the outcomes from the strategy using alternative drug regimens or alternative monitoring approaches. And there are a lot more analyses ongoing that will help us understand more about this. But clearly we need implementation studies of the strategy in broader populations, especially including HIV co-infected participants. And I must acknowledge the large team that conducted the trial and to the participants, especially for their extraordinary commitment with very low rates of loss to follow up that was essential to give us this high quality data set um, that we hope will have a major impact on our understanding and developing the way forward with shortening treatment for TB. Thank you very much. Welcome back everyone. And thank you to Amina, Leandra, and Nick for the presentations. We will now transition to the discussion and question and answer. So if you have questions for the presenters, please enter them using the Q&A function. And if you see a question that you share an interest in, you can upload it using the heart icon. So before we take wider questions uh, or questions from the wider audience, we'll start with comments and questions from the two community respondents we have on the panel. So Patrick, we'll start with you and then Diptendu, you'll go second. Um, so Patrick, please um, introduce yourself and go ahead. Patrick, do we, did we lose you? Okay, it's technical support. Patrick, are you here? Uh, so while we're waiting for Patrick, maybe we'll just switch the order. Diptendu, do you wanna go first and introduce yourself and provide your response. Hello. Am I audible? So we can hear you, but we, can, yeah, we also see you. Please go on. Hello, I'm Dipendu Bhattacharya. I am a uh, survivor of drug-resistant tuberculosis, and I am a member of TBCAP. Also, I am representing India in this forum. And uh, my uh, this, 
and especially drug sensitivity, which is often more to the more focus on shortening the drug resistant arm. But this one is very unique, uh, as he has pointed out that it was very equally important to uh, shorten the duration of the treatment so that we can uh, reallocate the resources in proper way. So thank you, Vic, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you, everyone, for all of your presentation. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, let me start with one. Uh, uh, let, uh, this is an open question to all. Anyone can answer. That uh, global pop population affected by TB is often more diverse in terms of age and comorbidity, comorbidities than um, the population typically included in TB clinical trials. Uh, I have seen the exclusion criteria, but uh, can the presenter comment on the data available to support the use of their regimens in specific population like uh, PLHAP, GBRA, pregnant women? People who use drugs, people who have with diabetes, I think those type still if there is any extrapolation we can infer from the data we have right now in our hand. Thank you. Thanks, Diptendu. Uh and before the panelists respond, maybe we'll try to take Patrick um and then open it up to the the panelists to, to reply. Patrick, can you try to unmute and see if it works for you? Okay, we see you, sir. We can hear you also. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so I will introduce myself because I don't know. I was speaking, but it looks like we're not able to hear me. So I'm Patrick Agassi. I'm the chair of the Global Tuberculosis Community Advisory Board. Um, so two of the of the three studies um, presented evaluated regimens that shift second line drugs to first line. So we've, we've seen some concern and reticence around this in the context of the study 31 regimen with the inclusion of moxifloxacin. And because we can expect the drug cost for this shorter regimen to be higher than what programs currently, currently pay for HRZE. So can the presenters please comment on any evidence generated through these trials that might help to address these concerns. And one, another concern of shifting the second line drugs to, to first line is the potential occurrence of resistance that might reduce the treatment options for the population directly affected. So how do you anticipate um, prevent, preventing occurrence of resistance with the proposed regimens? And then what options are left for people who do not have a favorable outcome with truncate TB or simplicity TB regimens, for example, those that require retreatment. So I hope you were able to, to hear. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Patrick. So now if we could maybe pull the three panelists up and give them each a chance to respond to those uh, three questions. and. Uh, Nick, since you're, you're up on the screen ready, maybe we'll let you go first. Um, sh shall I take one of them and then we we go around? Because there's quite a lot of questions. Um, yeah. So so maybe... I was just going to uh, start with, the, with uh, Dip Tendu's question first about um, the applicability of these results to uh, a broader population, including people with comorbidities and um, younger people, adolescents, children, and, and people who are pregnant. Uh, let's take that one first, and then um, we'll go to Patrick's questions after. Okay, so so for that one, it's relatively easy for truncate TB, I think, because this was quite a radical um, departure from normal treatment, which was, you know, it, it, it was sort of a, a, a 
nobody had done anything like this for quite quite some time, for about 40 years uh, since the last two month trial. So we 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 were fairly cautious um, initially about what populations we we included. So certainly, um, as I explained in the presentation, initially took moderate burden disease, only later opened it up to, to high burden disease with big cavities in the chest and so on. Um, we intended to enroll people with HIV infection uh, in the trial towards the end, but that 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 didn't happen. Um, I think just because the, the the demographics at the sites mainly and the limited time available, we certainly didn't um, uh, enroll children uh, or pregnant women um, or, or other risk groups. We, we enrolled diabetics, um, uh, people with controlled diabetes. So I think with truncate TB, it was meant it was meant to be. Um, you know, there's a lot of safety safety built into that in terms of taking a population where we wouldn't um, be exposing them to undue risk. I think the next steps would be, um, you know, some implementation research where we might perhaps cautiously explore that approach in, in broader populations to, to, to make sure it was okay. But for that, for that trial, that wasn't the objective to make it broadly generalizable uh, to high risk groups. Thanks, Nick. Maybe next uh, we'll ask Leandra to respond. So although we haven't seen results on sympathy TB, could you comment on the inclusion exclusion criteria and the eventual kind of generalizability of, of the results to uh, the populations that uh, Dipton do mentioned in his question? Yes, yeah, so um, hello, everybody. Um, so all our TB Alliance trials have enrolled um, obviously TB participants, but um, co-infected with HIV so that we, you know, we ensure that we're working toward um, more optimal treatments, especially for those on, um, on ARVs. Um, and um, just to mention, I know we're coming up to the end of the hour. Um, we are also able to, to confirm that we will be sharing um, the results um, at Croy in February in 2023. Um, yeah, so I don't know. <laughs> there's little time left. I don't know how much else you want me to address at this time. And with regards to the the pregnancy, no, we didn't enroll pregnant known pregnant women, but we um, we did either discontinue them if they were on treatment and refer them to the NTP during the um, their participation in the trial if they did become pregnant. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Leandra. And I think um, the organizers have given us an additional 10 minutes, so we can go okay. up until five minutes before the hour. Um, okay. But maybe we'll bring this question next to Amina. And although Ripa Short failed yeah. um, to demonstrate non-inferiority, I guess the question for you, uh, extrapolating from what Diptendu asked, is if you think that the Ripa Short um, regimens may have worked if you looked at them in a different population or a more narrow specific population um, of people. And if you have any plans to do further research um, on this in the future. Um, although the results didn't meet um, um, non-inferiority margin, I think it all better still, all my PIs think that it, the, the trial was a success. And given the chance, they would happily take the 18 month regimen for because it's given only for four months and they would gain two months and improve um, compliance so the whole regimen would be better for the, the patients and for the, uh, the treatment uh, administration in that country now when you think about the results the the, the control regimen had a 94 percent uh, success rate. But the 12 month regimen had a 90%. I mean, we, had we increased the sample size, I think that, that that difference would have disappeared. So, given half a chance, I would, and we so badly need a four month regimen. And this, in this one, contained drugs that all the centers are used to using. I would say, trial was not a failure, it was a success. And I would happily recommend that 
either the 12 or the 18 month regimen be rolled out immediately. And I have to say that my PIs would agree as well. We are planning for the trials, but right now I think really, I think we have a good enough result to roll out. Thanks, Amina. And and also, uh, just to flag, we do have an example of a successful four-month regimen in drug-sensitive TB in TBTC study 31, ACTG A5349, which is already recommended by the World Health Organization. Um, uh, yeah, I, so, I agree, Lindsay, but the thing is, as you know, if nobody, everybody stopped manufacturing rifapentine now. So, it's going to be a couple of years before that is available. Uh, so I really think that the Riffa Short results should be rolled out. I think that one stands out right now as the best regimen to roll out for drug sensitive TB. Yes, there are definitely some challenges with Riffapentine supply and price and uh, formulation type for, for the study 31 regimen, but those things can hopefully be overcome. And as you said, um, yeah, we'll, we'll have to um, see how these results get interpreted by policymakers um, and, and what moves forward. Um, I want to move now to Patrick with uh, questions. Um, so maybe we'll just quickly restate them and we'll go across the panel in the same order. Uh, two of the three studies presented evaluate regimens that shift second line to drugs first line. And we've seen some concerns around this approach, even in the context of the study 31 regimen, which, which as we just discussed, includes oxyfloxacin. Um, and also drug costs for these shorter regimens uh, might be higher uh, than what programs currently pay for the standard of care six month regimen with HRZE. So can the presenters please comment um, on any evidence generated through these trials that might help to address these concerns. Um, and we'll start with uh, Nick. Sure. Um, oh, my God. My, yeah. Uh, so we, we we have a planned health economics um, analysis within truncate TB. Obviously, the it's, it's, it's absolutely fundamental to the strategy, the trade off between short treatment and the resources needed to monitor you know, the savings on drug costs because they're short, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the health economics um, for the for the strategy investigating truncate TB is fundamental. Um, so we'd be looking at that. And of course, the big driver of costs is the cost of cost of drugs, not so much the standard drugs. So that's why, um, you know, the RIFA short regimens, are, uh, uh, you know, score score highly in that respect because the, the drugs are already uh, manufactured at mass scale and, and very cheap. Obviously, when you bring in linazolid, it puts up the cost a little bit. If you bring in bedaquiline, it puts up the cost a lot. But that's based on current prices. If you if you were to move bedaquiline into scale up for you know globally for first line, then that scale would in, in, invariably bring down the costs. I don't know how low it could go with scale, but um, you know it's those those kind of considerations. So um, at, at the moment. It wouldn't be a cost-effective regimen to have a have a first-line regimen with Adaclin, but one needs to look at these things because at scale it, it might it might well be. And and the thing you know the question that always comes up is, what, what, isn't there a danger of taking your second-line drug and moving it to first line? Um, and I'd say abs absolutely not. You want your best foot forward in first line. The problem is, um, you know, the first line has been suboptimal for the longest time. And that's what's you know driven large problems with drug resistance. So if we can get a drug that works superbly in first line, it should be there and uh, not held back to sort of mitigate catastrophes later on. That would be my opinion. That's great. Thanks, Nick. Uh, maybe we'll ask uh, Leandra to respond to the same. In Simplicity TV, are you planning to collect any kind of supplementary evidence that um, might address some of the concerns? Yeah, so again, um, Lindsay and, and everybody in the group, um, the Simplicity B specific results we will be presenting at CROI in February, but just um, to to address it in the broader TB Alliance um, um, setting, um, we are developing set regimens where we know um, each um, drug is contributing and we, we, um, we are working towards 
Um, you know, I believe that people with TB deserve the best possible therapy available to, to next point. Um, and four months is definitely a major improvement from six, especially with um, um, from a patient-centered perspective. And, um, and and we do keep affordability and access uh, front and center from the beginning, well before we even advance the drugs from regimens into, into human studies. And I think that probably is less relevant for the relevant of the RIFA short trial. Uh, because they were all kind of standard first line regimens just with a, with high dose or famfacin, so maybe less of um, a concern there. Um, I think uh, Nick and Leandra, maybe you already in your response answered Patrick's question about um, uh, resistance and uh, how to address that. So maybe we will shift to questions that are being submitted in the Q&A panel. Um, so the first one is, uh, that was very interesting. Thanks. Many studies have shown pill burden as an important acceptability factor. Was this perceived as a barrier in any of these studies? Um, and maybe we will let uh, Amina go first, and then Leandra, and then Nick, Nick to uh, just reverse the order on this one. Yes, definitely. The pill burden is a concern because we've seen this. The unless the apt patients are seen to swallow the drug, they could take it in their hands and go around the corner and they throw out the rifampicin because it makes the urine red. So that is why we introduced direct observed treatment. But as I said, uh, um, it, it raises um, f f frowns from other groups to have somebody at home monitoring uh, the treatment. And the other thing about that um, is, is that we already have combined formulations with the rifampicin. So in the refresh short, if we rolled out the four month rest, and we only had to increase, but not only, but just had to increase the number of the four, four drug formulations. So in my opinion, um, that would reduce eventually the, the pill burden and, and would become acceptable. And different formulations would then be able to come out that would even reduce further the pill burden. Leandra, did you want to respond to pill burden next? So I think, Amina, you know, we we are we are on the same page, and you know, go, I mean, if you go down to um, I suppose trial um, or protocol level, you know, the the weight banding of HRZ EHR is up to five tablets a day, and the BPAMs Z regimen. Um, was not dissimilar, and yes, we um, we do um, um, considerably aim to develop shorter resumes because the 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 pull burden is a considerable um, concern. And and without wanting to repeat the the issue on the dots, it's it's the sentiment our clinical researchers share um, with Amina. Yeah. Just to push back a little because. I know like our, our community respondents, maybe you want to say, comment on direct observed therapy. I feel like there are lots of um, diseases where uh, people take medicines on their own and treatment literacy maybe is, is a, a different approach to help overcome uh, some of the concerns you're raising. Um, but maybe I'll just take a second to open it to the panel in case you want to respond to um, the DOT uh, issues that have been raised and alternative approaches. So, Lindsay, you're asking about alternative approaches to DOT, so things like video DOT, that kind of thing. Yeah, especially as we think about maybe how these regimens, um, if they are recommended by WHO, might be rolled out in program settings. Um, and how can we help and support patients to adhere to treatment while also, um, you know, taking a person-centered approach to that? Um, which may not always be directly observed therapy, especially if someone has to travel far to receive it or it interrupts, you know, their lives in, in, in ways that are um, maybe unsustainable. Yeah. So certainly in, in, in truncate TB, but in, increasingly at the sites that we work with, um, are getting very, uh, very used to um, video DOT and technologies 
um, brought in to, to supervise uh, treatment um, and work, working with the participants to ensure treatment. So, I mean, I think I think it's I think it's workable. We we have very high adherence on the truncate TB regimens, and I, and like many things, I think that trial stress tested because we had five drugs in the regimen, so you know it was up to fifteen pills. Um, but the clinicians at the sites, and and this is borne out by the performance in the trial of the, of the participants, is that they, they were very willing um, to take more pills as a trade off for having a shorter regimen for having a you know a marked reduction in duration of treatment yeah. um the participants were you know were very enthusiastic about that and were prepared to take more pills um you know and that's worst case scenario with nothing co-formulated if you find a regimen with four or five drugs and it works well and you, then you can start co-formulating and bringing the pill burden down um then i think everybody's a winner and studies have shown that people, even the standard regimen, patients would happily take it for three months, even four months. After that, the dropout starts. So if the shorter regimen of four months has a slightly higher pill burden, I still think there would be greater compliance because of the reduction in duration of the treatment. Great, thank you so much. I think we are at time and now we'll have to close. So I just want to thank um, my co-chair Rosa, our community respondents, Patrick and Dipton Du, and uh, the presenters, uh, Amina, Nick, and Leandra for, for joining this session and all of you joining um, in the audience. So thank you very much, everyone, uh, and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you.